we do thank you that you are close. And Lord, for those that want to draw closer to you today, Lord, you are there waiting for us, Lord. The perfect gentleman. On this Independence Day weekend, Lord, we thank you so much for the freedom that is found where your spirit is, Lord. Because that is true. Where your spirit is, there is freedom. So, Lord, we pray that you'd find a congregation, a church that is ready to receive your word, Lord. Ears that are open, hearts that are ready to be molded, Lord. So we give it to you. We lift it up. And would you find a congregation, Lord, that's changed when we leave this place, Lord, leaving this building different people than the way that we came in. So we give it to you and we lift it up. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Wednesday night, we're gonna continue our study, uh, but I wanted to do something as maybe because I was gone uh, this past uh, week, I was, I was thinking uh, I need to catch up and gain some ground today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a Wednesday night right now. Are you guys game? Yeah. Wednesday night, yes. Well, let's go. Mark chapter eight, if you turn there. And I'm, uh, if you've never been to a Wednesday night, we just go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, right through the Bible. And we don't skip a verse or a word in the Bible. And um, it's so huge. I, I think that Wednesday night's the backbone of what Athey Creek does. If you've never been to a Wednesday night, what I'm about to do now is kind of like what we do on Wednesday night. Uh, but uh, we got a little chapter eight here and I wanted to kind of cover that and then we'll pick up chapter nine on Wednesday night. So, um, well, America, we've been blessed with great provision. We were in the wealthiest country in the world in so many ways and uh, prosperity. Um, and, you know, we all technically go, God bless America. God shed his grace on thee. We understand it's from the Lord. But do we really understand that? Sometimes we forget our provision is from the Lord. Um, we can think that we're the ones who provided for ourselves and we're the ones. We pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, you know, as good capitalists, uh, you know, we, we said, uh, the only problem with capitalism is sometimes we think we're the ones who did it all. Uh, when really it's the Lord who's been gracious. Our economy, um, uh, our, our success as a nation. Now I have to admit, as we get more corrupt as a nation, don't be surprised uh, if all those other things start to fall, which I, I wonder if we're seeing some of that precursor today with the inflation and all the stuff going on, the, the value of the dollar, what's gonna happen with that. But one thing I'd like to remind us is your provision does not come from Wall Street or your financial portfolio or even wise planning or good hard work. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, hard work is biblical. And, and the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So work is important. Uh, but um, the, uh, we gotta remember the provision comes from the Lord. A few uh, quick reminders of that is James 1.17, where it says every good gift and every perfect gift uh, is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variable, no changing, uh, neither shadow of turning. Job, who had it all and then lost it all, except for his wife, which if you know the story, that would have been the nice thing to lose. Um, uh, it's true, uh, she's the one who said, curse God and die, Job. Um, but um, but he, he, she stuck around. But Job rightly, uh, with great humility, which we all need Job-like humility, when he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Um, what do you do? What do we do when, when you know, we find ourselves, uh, you know, maybe our finances aren't as strong as they once were and, and do we even know what it means to be Job? But uh, I would su suspect the answer is no. Um, Jesus taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, not our daily filet mignon or uh, whatever. He said our daily bread, that which sustains life. A provision, uh, it comes by asking the Lord for provision. Um, and uh, Jesus uh, is the provider. Uh, he's the one who satisfies. And Philippians reminds us, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now the disciples here in Math, uh, pardon me, Mark chapter eight, the disciples need a reminder that Jesus is able to satisfy, to provide, to take care of the needs of the people. Now, they've already had a lesson. They've already had Provision 101 class with Jesus. Now they're gonna have Provision 102 class. And it's gonna be shocking how they've forgotten about the first things they were supposed to learn. It reminds me of us. 
we all tend to think, oh yeah, I've learned that, I've heard that, I've, I know that Bible story. But do we remember when we're in trouble, when things are tough, do we remember the promises of God and the provision of God? Well, the disciples, they're gonna struggle with this one, uh, just like I think we, we do and will and uh, oftentimes uh, have struggled with this. So it's here uh, in Mark chapter eight, where we pick the story up in verse one. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way for diverse of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000 and he sent them away. Here we have the story of the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, now some of you are like, wait a minute, Brett. Wasn't it 5,000? Which one is it, 4,000 or 5,000? The answer? Yes, good. Uh, now, now um, this is important. Um, there's a bunch of things about this story. Uh, by the way, the, the, the crazy cardigan sweater, pipe puffing wearing, uh, you know, uh, professors in colleges and universities, they'll get these, you know, kids that right out of high school say, we know the Bible's full of errors because there's contradictions in the Bible. Like for example, was that feeding of 5,000 or 4,000? And um, was it 12 baskets or seven baskets that was left over? See, the authors of the gospels got it all wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about. The Bible's not inspired, throw it out. You know, and, and that's kind of what they do with this kind of stuff. I'm just gonna say they're a bunch of nincompoops. Uh, and I'm not even gonna say I'm sorry for that. Um, they are, uh, they just are, because they're, they're, all you gotta do is read the rest of the story. That's, context is really important. We'll talk about that as well. But um, let's, let's talk about this. Now, Jesus is in a, a, an area called the Decapolis in this part of the story. Now, the Decapolis, it's, it's what it, it sounds like. If you know your Greek words, deca and polis. What does deca mean? Ten, polis, city, like met metropolis, city. Um, so it's, it's 10 cities and there were kind of a group of 10 famous cities in the Middle East during the first century called the Decapolis. If this is uh, the Middle East, as we zoom into Israel in that region, um, we start to see these 10 cities that were not all in Israel. In fact, only one of these cities was in what we would call Israel today. The rest of them were in Syria and in Jordan, the nation of Jordan in modern days. Um, but noteworthy of these cities, of course, Probably one that you should know uh, is the, the northernmost Decapolis city was Damascus. Um, that's a famous city for a lot of reasons. Did you know that Damascus is the oldest city in the world today? Um, it's kind of an important thing. And it's, it's exciting if you're a Bible prophecy student because um, the Bible says Damascus will be destroyed where no one will ever live there again, completely leveled, uh, where people won't live there. Um, the, the thing that's shocking about that is Damascus is the oldest city that has continued to go with nonstop with people living there throughout all of history. Um, so what's that mean? It means that that prophecy of Isaiah 17 has yet to have uh, happened. But if you know your geopolitics, it could happen any minute right now. Because what's happening in Damascus today is Iran is gathering their arms because they wanna be in the northern po most part there of, of Israel. Uh, and what is Iran? They don't even try to pretend what they're trying to do. They say, we're gonna blow Israel off the map. We're gonna drive the Jews into the sea. And they threaten daily to attack the Jews on the news today. The prime minister, the president of Iran has said, we're gonna wipe out the Jews first, you know? Um, so they're trying to get their arms all piled up as they have access to Syria in Damascus. So the Jews are bombing Damascus daily. If you watch your news, uh, the Jews are flying, uh, uh, you know, attacks in often, uh, weekly, uh, in, into Damascus. And they're usually blowing up airstrips and keeping the Iranians from being able to put those, those high-tech missiles uh, in and installing them in those northern cities over Israel. Now, the Jews have, for the last 20 years have told uh, the Syrians 
and the Iranians, if one of those missiles flies across our border in the north, we will make, they said, we will make Damascus a parking lot. And they said that, they've said that for 20 years. Thus, none of those missiles have crossed over. There's been those goofy, you know, Katusha rockets that are very un, uh, not accurate. Uh, and they kind of lob them over and the Iron Dome tends to catch them uh, from Lebanon and other places in Hamas down in, 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 in the Gaza. But uh, it's interesting that Damascus is a, a powder keg right now. And if, if they ever uh, attack Israel from the north, Israel's promised they will make Damascus a parking lot, which the Bible says that's gonna happen. So something to watch, at least, if you're into Bible prophecy, which you should be. Anyway, um, uh, other noteworthy cities here uh, in this uh, story, um, uh, Scythopolis uh, is um, better known today if you go to Israel, Beit Shan is the name of that city. And if you've been to Israel, you might've looked at that amazing archeological dig of Beit Shan. That's the city where Saul and his sons were killed and hung from the walls of Beit Shan. That's an interesting city. Uh, a couple other noteworthy, Philadelphia is what is modern day Amman, Jordan today. Uh, and uh, Jerasa is a place we go to, when we go to uh, Israel, we cross over into Jordan, go to Jerash as is the name today, or Jarish, some people say. Um, and it's a, um, an amazing archeological ruin that was a twin city of Jerusalem and it was leveled in the first century. So when they dug up Jerash, they propped all the pillars back up, put all the temples back up where they were. And it looks like Jerusalem did 2000 years ago. So it's kind of like a, a model city of, of, this, of Jerusalem. So it's, it's a really educational stop there to stop at Jerash. Um, those are interesting parts of the city, but I digress. These 10 cities, Jesus is ministering now. He didn't just minister around Galilee or in Jerusalem. He also went around these Decapolis cities and spread the gospel. Now, just a quick question. Who was he probably most speaking to when he was on this Decapolis mission? Jews or Gentiles? Yes, the people of the Decapolis cities were mostly made up of Gentiles and that's kind of an important thing. Um, so people are coming from all over these Decapolis cities to uh, hear and see Jesus. Now, um, now um, in, uh, in, in this story, liberal theologians, the cardigan wearing pipe puffers, they say it's only one story, uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. They say, it's just the same story. They just got some of their facts wrong. That's, that's kind of the way that works. I'm gonna show you ridiculously proof positive that they're wrong about that. Um, but uh, be careful if you, all you gotta do a lot of times is look at things in context. Um, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 are two different stories, two different time periods, two different people groups. Um, and uh, Matthew and Mark, the gospels that record both of these, um, Matthew was written to the Jews. Mark was written to the Gentiles, the Romans. Remember, we studied that several weeks back. And it's interesting. Um, so what we, what we have here is a compare and contrast. Would you allow me to do that here? In fact, um, uh, the, the difference between the feeding of the 5,000 versus the feeding of the 4,000. The first thing that you'll note is the location that I've already mentioned. The feeding of the 5,000 took place in Galilee near Bethesda, where the feeding of the 4,000 I've already mentioned took place in the Decapolis. They're very different places, uh, two different stories. And like I mentioned, the people of the feeding of the 5,000, because they were in Galilee, it was a bunch of Jews that were fed by Jesus, the, the five loaves and two fishes. But the feeding of the 4,000 was mostly Gentiles there in the Decapolis region. Um, no, speaking of the five loaves and two fish, um, actually the 5,000, uh, they had five loaves and two fish but the numbers are different on this one. The feeding of the 4,000 was seven loaves and a few fish. Um, you say, Brett, who cares about this? Well, these are differences that some people say, oh, the gospel writers just made a mistake. It's all the same story. Um, but remember, we had this in Mark already. Mark's gospel chapter six records the feeding of the 5,000. Mark chapter eight here in our text is the feeding of the 4,000. Um, there's a few other differences. Um, the feeding of the 5,000, the people had been with Jesus for only one day. The feeding of the 4,000, these people of Decapolis had been following Jesus around for three days. Um, they're particularly hungry, no doubt. Um, the gathering of the food afterward, there were 12 baskets full on uh, the 5,000, but there were seven baskets uh, left at the feeding of the 4,000. Now this is interesting um, to me uh, because um, which one had more food left over at the end, the 12 baskets full or the seven baskets full? Well, I, I got in parentheses a hint for you. Um, it was actually more food 
uh, that was left over in the seven than it was in the 12. Well, how do you know that, Brett? It's the Greek word that's employed. Remember, the Greek language is very colorful and there's not just one word for basket. There's all kinds of words for baskets. Um, and as it turns out, um, the word for basket used in the 12 full baskets, um, well, it's like a little basket uh, that's a bucket. Let me show you those Greek words, by the way, if you're interested. Uh, the basket in the feeding of the 5,000 was called a kofinos. And the word kofinos, it means a small little wicker basket, a little bucket. And it's, by the way, it's a Jewish bu a bucket. Like the Jews used the, the kofinos. That was not a Gentile thing. Um, and it was about the size of a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket. Um, we're gonna get hungry by the end of this service. Uh, so uh, a little Kentucky Fried KFC bucket. Um, now the Greek word that's used in Mark 8 here describing the seven baskets, it's a large reed basket or like a hamper sized basket. It's big um, and it's a Gentile basket. By the way, the Jews didn't use the, the supris um, uh, or the suris, uh, they, they, used, uh, they used different names for other baskets, but it was a Greek more uh, uh, term that was more of a, uh, not a Jew thing, but it was a large basket. Do you remember when they let Paul down in a basket on the side of a wall uh, when he was in trouble in that one town? They let him down in a spuris. That, that, that's how big you could put a person in that. So you have seven of those baskets gathered uh, full of food left over. Um, Brett, why are you talking about that? Um, because I love food, uh, that's it. Uh, no, just, <laughs> just kidding. No, there's actually some spirits. What's the point of the two stories? What's the reason why we have the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, and these specific numbers and all that stuff? Well, there's a couple things. Well, high level, we remember that Jesus is the bread of life. Amen? He is the one who satisfies. In fact, in both these stories, the people ate till they were satisfied. That's what Jesus does. Jesus, Jesus satisfies the hungry soul. Um, but I love these two stories separate out because it shows that Jesus is the bread of life to the Jews, the feeding of the 5,000, but he's also the bread of life to the Gentiles, the feeding of the 4,000. Praise the Lord for that. Are numbers significant in the Bible? Yes, if you're a Bible student, you know, 12 is a number that's always associated with Israel, because they had the 12 tribes and 12, the number of kind of government of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel, um, the 12 elders of Israel and stuff like that. So the, the feeding, having 12 baskets left over, that's kind of cool. Seven is the number of completion, perfection. And the Lord completes his work being the bread of life to the Gentiles. He completes that work by the saving of the Gentiles. There's some great imagery. Uh, and, the, and, and then the completion is the Gentiles. If you know your Bible prophecy, the whole story comes to an end at the fullness of the Gentiles, Romans 11:25. Um, all of Israel will be ultimately saved when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in after the rapture of the church. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking quickly of things that maybe some of you Bible prophecy students kind of recognize. If you're new to this though, there's so many neat dots that are connected when you read the Bible. It's just, the longer you stick with the Bible reading it, it just gets more and more rewarding seeing all the, the dots that are connected. So I love this, uh, this, this imagery of the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. And, and it really speaks of Jesus as the bread of life who provides for us. And the disciples have to learn, oh yeah, Jesus, he's able to do this. Now, we're gonna see later on in this chapter where the disciples are a little twitchy when it comes to bread and the topic of bread and did they bring enough food and all that stuff. We'll, we'll see that as we continue. So verse 10 goes on and says, and straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came to the parts of Dalmanutha. Now, where in the world is Dalmanutha? Uh, we're not 100% sure. But we think it's, most scholars would say it's um, in a place called modern day, we call this Magdala. Um, Dalmanutha is Magdala. Where's Magdala? It's on the uh, seashore of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus goes from the Decapolis and he sails in a ship across the Sea of Galilee to um, near Tiberias, if you know your Sea of Galilee region, a place called Magdala. By the way, Magdala is famous for Mary of Magdal Mary Magdalene, who was from Magdala. But um, in, in today's, uh, if you're going to Israel, you definitely wanna stop in Magdala because they found in the last 10 or 15 years, they found a, um, a first century synagogue. There's several, there's one in Capernaum and a few others around, but this one's particularly interesting because it really is very, very likely Jesus taught from the scrolls of the Old Testament 
in this synagogue that they found in Magdala. Uh, and it wasn't there 10 years ago. They, they were gonna put a hotel in that region. And as they were digging up for the hotel, they found these beautiful mosaics uh, in the, the, covered up by debris. And as they dug it up, they realized it was a synagogue of the Jews from the first century. And so Jesus, the Bible tells us, Jesus traveled to all the synagogues around the Galilee region, teaching as an itinerant rabbi. The Bible tells us that. So it's very likely Jesus walked through the doors of that synagogue and they've, they've unearthed that. It's really a cool thing to see. Um, so that's where Jesus, he sails across the Sea of Galilee. Now he's in Magdala or Dalmanutha. Um, and what, is, what happens there? Verse 11. It says, and the Pharisees, back to Jewish land here, the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. Now I gotta say the English translation here softens the blow of what this is. What does the NIV say? It says they came to argue, I think, with him. Is that what your NIV says? Some of the newer translations? Test him, argue with him. Uh, um, it's, it's very, these guys are very prickly and they're trying to do Jesus in. That's the English kind of says, oh, they wanted to talk with Jesus. No, they were, they were wanting to do him in, test him, tempting him, arguing with them. One thing you don't see Jesus do is stand around arguing with people. I wonder if we could do a lot less arguing. Are you an arguer? Especially, I, I really worry about some of you that think you're being effective online with your comment section of, of teachings and stuff and thinking that you're gonna save souls. Uh, I, you know, I've been in ministry for a lot of years and I've never once met a person, hey, how did you come to know Jesus? Well, I was a troll online and I was, uh, you know, as an atheist and I was bashing Christians and suddenly somebody just t put a comment that made me, well, what must I do to be saved? Well, how do I meet this Jesus? You know, um, uh, that, that never happens. Uh, uh, how many of you were saved by, uh, by being uh, commented on online? Anybody wanna, no, no, okay. Well, that's, that's the third service where no one uh, was saved by that. So uh, if you're spending a lot of time trying to convince people online, I'm not sure that's a great use of your time. Um, uh, by the way, um, Jesus, when these guys come to do this, look at his response in verse 12. It says, and he, Jesus, sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. So what did Jesus do? He went from the, the 10 cities, the Decapolis, sailed across the Sea of Galilee. The Pharisees said, hey, we wanna talk with you. Jesus got back in the ship and sailed the other side again. Uh, the end of his visit. Uh, Maybe that's a good lesson for you and for me. What makes God sigh? What makes you sigh? You're in traffic on the 217? <sighs> or the Taco Bell line takes more than three minutes? <sighs> like what, what makes you sigh? Um, uh, I, what makes God sigh? I mean, think about that for a second. We, we know two things already. Do you remember in chapter seven, we saw there with the deaf, dumb guy who was uh, needing healing and Jesus comes and it says he sighed. Uh, looking to heaven, he sighed and he said, that means be opened and he opened the deaf guy's ears. It's a great story. But that was, I think, if you can interpret the sigh of compassion. Jesus sort of sighed there with that poor deaf guy and, and healed him and he sighed thinking, oh, I love the sigh of compassion, but what's this a sigh of? Well, it seems like Jesus even sort of has a sigh here of kind of like, I can't, I just, I'm just, uh, you know, amazed at the unbelief and the hardness of heart of these people. So much that he just sighs. It's like a, I would say a sigh of frustration, but I don't know that Jesus gets frustrated. I don't even know about that, but, but it's obviously a sigh of, you know, Jesus does marvel at people's unbelief in other stories. I think the sigh is that kind of a, man, I can't believe these people. Um, it's like, wow, uh, the hardness of these people's heart, a sigh that Jesus shows. Now, Jesus bolts, he gets out of there. Why? Should he have stayed and debated with them, argued with them? Jesus actually talked more directly about this to the disciples when he was teaching the disciples about talking, sharing the gospel. And maybe you and I can learn from what Jesus said. And remember in Matthew chapter seven, verse six, Jesus used this language. He said, you know, um, don't be casting your pearls before the swine. Now, some of you are like, well, Brett, is he calling those Pharisees pigs? Um, not necessarily. 
Uh, but what he is saying, there's no sense in preaching the value of pearls to pigs. Pigs will never appreciate the, the wealth, the beauty, the um, extraordinary nature of a pearl. Pigs will never appreciate that. So Jesus was instructing his disciples how to handle rejection um, as, it, as it meant to going and sharing the gospel with people. If people aren't gonna listen, don't throw the pearls to the swine. They're not gonna learn what the pearls are. And the idea is there are other people who need to hear the gospel and they're ready to hear it and they'll receive the wisdom of the gospel. Um, don't waste your time. There's a point where you need to stop you know, trying to throw the pearls to the swine. <clears throat> and some people just wanna argue. They don't wanna hear what you're saying. They don't wanna grow or learn or anything like that. And, um, and they were searching for a sign. Um, and so Jesus says, I'm not, I don't have time for this. What does Jesus have time for? Anyone who would listen. Anyone who had a soft heart and was willing to listen to the gospel truth. Um, be careful, Christian. Don't just pour, throw the pearls to the swine. If, if there's people that are blasting away and they have their mind already made up, there's a point where you need to uh, step away. And Jesus knew exactly how to do that. Now, um, they were searching for a sign. One thing that Mark's gospel does, as we've been talking about, everything's really fast paced. Do you feel that? If you're familiar with the gospel of Matthew, when you read the gospel of Mark, it's almost laughable because Mark just kind of whew, rips through it. Um, you know, they've done studies. This is kind of funny. I know it's not politically correct, but um, uh, years ago, they did a study of how many words men speak in any given day and how many words women speak in any given day. It's just, I'm telling you, this is math, but it's just about twice, uh, twice. So like if you ask Debbie, hey, how did you and Brett meet and get to know each other? Um, you, you better be ready for like a three hour story. It's a, it's a beautiful story. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, but if you ask me the same question, I'll tell you my version, it's like 30 seconds and it's still beautiful. Uh, I just see it a little differently. Uh, I've only got a few words to explain the wonderful meeting of my beautiful wife. Debbie will tell you all the details that I've forgotten. Um, that's just the difference, I think, between uh, men and women oftentimes. And now there are some uh, you know, crossing of that a little bit, but, um, but Mark's the guy who says, no nonsense, we're gonna just give you the meat and potatoes. Uh, whereas like Matthew and Luke, they fill in all the gaps and all the details. Uh, so if you're that person that likes kind of the short and sweet, go to the Gospel of Mark, he, he cuts it short. In fact, uh, let me show you what I mean. Do you remember when we read in verse 12, Jesus says, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Does it feel like we're leaving something out? Well, if you remember the, the Matthew's account, he fills in some of the gaps. Uh, now, now notice, I want you to notice the difference between the Matthew account and the Mark account because it'll help you understand the audience. Matthew uh, says, a wicked and adulterous generation. He adds that seeketh after a sign. There shall be no sign given to it, period, in the gospel of Mark. Uh, but Jesus then goes in, in Matthew, we read, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Um, why did Mark leave that out? Have you ever thought about that? Is that incomplete gospel? Why do we have the gospel that doesn't give us the full story? Throw Mark out. Let's just read the full story in Matthew. No, there's a reason Mark leaves it out. Remember, Mark's audience is the Romans, the Gentiles. And the, you know, we all know the story of Jonah and the big fish, and so it has meaning to us. But in those days, if you weren't a Jew, you didn't know about Noah, or Jonah and the big fish story. So Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is just, it's abbreviated because it's the audience. Uh, it's a wicked generation that seeks after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it. That's all Mark gives us in that particular account. Um, now, what's the sign of Jonah? Well, Jesus would uh, talk about that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the Old Testament stories didn't mean much to the Gentiles, but for the Jews, the messianic concept of Jesus, the Messiah, um, that was something that would be a sign for the Jews that Jesus would die on a cross and uh, raise up from the grave and resurrect. Uh, even as Jonah was sort of resurrected out of the belly of the whale, so too Jesus would on the third day be raised from the, the dead. And that would be the sign that he would show the Jews that he was the Messiah. Uh, does that make sense? Now, this idea of a sign, I need to reiterate, I've talked about this before, but um, be careful Christians, don't be chasing after signs. Do you get a sense that Jesus is not really into showing signs? 
well, Brett, he's healing everybody and raising people from the dead, sure. Well, he's not into performing it uh, as a big show. He, 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 Jesus was never about, hey, look at my signs and wonders. That was the people that did that. Uh, now, you, you should be really glad I wasn't Jesus. Uh, if I were Jesus and these dudes came up, show us a sign that you're really who you are. Okay, you want a sign? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna take all of you guys that are here asking this question, I'm gonna take your ears and put them where your eyeballs are. And I'm gonna take your nose and put it on your rear end. Then I'm gonna put your lips and put them on your toes. Five, four, three, two, one. Bing! Any other questions? That's the way I would have handled that. Now, thank the Lord I'm not Jesus. Or if I was in a really bad mood, okay, uh, pink mist for brains. I'm gonna just splatter your heads in three, two, one. Uh, but that's not Jesus. Jesus just says it's a wicked and adulterous generation that wants to, uh, to have a sign. Um, you know, what's funny is churches make this mistake. Whole denominations that run around chasing after signs and wonders. I think you have to watch out for that. Don't get me wrong, I do believe signs and wonders are part of the Christian faith. I'm not one who says, you know, those things have ceased, no longer is there healing and no longer speaking in tongues. I don't believe that. I believe that the spirit is alive and well and manifesting himself through the church, through healing and all the manifestations. First Corinthians chapter 12 tells us that. But the thing is, we don't chase after that. It's not all about that. What we do is we look to Jesus. Jesus is the main thing. And the Bible says in Mark's gospel, by the way, signs and wonders will follow them that believe. The problem is Christians are following after signs and wonders. And there's, there's whole churches that have, you know, Hogwarts for Christians, where you go and learn magical things and how to, how to cast demons out, how to, you know, heal people and stuff. I think that's misguided and it's getting the emphasis wrong. And a lot of it's just a bunch of theatrics anyway. We have to be careful. It sort of delegitimizes what the Lord really is doing in healing and in powerful things. Watch out for chasing after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders will follow them that believe, even as Jesus went around walking down the street and people were touching him. And he, you know, if I were a nice Jesus, I would have said, uh, you want a sign? What about all these people that have been healed as I've just walked down the street and they've touched my garment and they're healed? What about the dead Jairus' daughter, the 12 year old who was raised from death? That's a pretty good sign. Well, you know, they weren't really interested in a sign. And let me just remind you, Signs and wonders never really produce faith. We think they do. Oh, if I could just see the Red Sea part as the Jews in the wilderness. Well, did that make them believe? No, 10 minutes later, they're unbelieving again. Signs and wonders never produce faith. What is it that produces real faith? Anybody? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let me remind you of what Jesus said to Thomas. You can jot this down in your notes, uh, I'll just r remind you real quick. Uh, in John 20, verse 24, um, it says, but Thomas, uh, one of the 12 called Didymus, the word Didymus means twin. So some people believe doubting Thomas had a doubting twin. Um, we don't know who that twin is, but uh, he was not with the disciples when Jesus came and appeared to them. But he says, the other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see his, his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, the disciples were within and Thomas was with them. And then Jesus appeared, the doors being shut. And he stood in the midst of them and said, peace be unto you. And then he turned to Thomas and said, reach thither thy finger and hold, behold my hands and reach thither my hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Now there's the first thing I learned from this is the Lord Jesus knows what we're saying behind closed doors. Yeah. Thomas is like, I will not believe unless I see. And then Jesus, eight days later, bling, 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 he shows up and he says, Thomas, go ahead, put your finger in the hole, put your hand in the side. Uh, Jesus knows what you're saying behind closed doors. That's the first thing I learned. But what is Thomas's response to this? When he hears Jesus, you know, he says, be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered verse 28 and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now question, if Jesus was not God, would he have allowed Thomas to call him that? Of course not. Um, but Jesus was God uh, and 
when he says, my Lord and my God, Jesus doesn't correct him. You know, <clears throat> they tried to worship Paul and Barnabas and those guys as if they were gods. And what did those guys do? They ripped their clothes and we are not gods. Do not worship us. Don't fall down and worship us. And that's what Jesus would have done had he been a prophet or a teacher like Oprah Winfrey's claims. But no, Jesus is God in the flesh. Uh, Emmanuel, God with us. And when he says, my Lord and my God, um, now Thomas is getting it. And Jesus answers and said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed, or literally happy, are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus tells us something that's a great secret here. You and I say, well, if I could only see, then I'd really believe. Well, actually, Jesus says something, you know, God tells humanity something here, that it's better for you to believe without seeing. You'll be happier. Happiness comes from just having faith, believing without seeing, without knowing the answer, without knowing the bulletproof evidence of the existence of Christ or the God or all that. Um, I'm not saying you can't search for that evidence because it's there to be found. I'm just saying it's more blessed if you just have faith. And that's the way we come to Christ. Um, we, we have faith, blessed, happy. Um, uh, signs never produce real faith, but real faith brings happiness. That's what Jesus says here. Well, we move on back to chapter eight in verse 14. It says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they, the disciples reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we have no bread. This cracks me up. Now, those poor guys, those poor disciples, I feel so bad for them. You, when you feel like a nincompoop around Jesus, always perfect. But Jesus is, uh, you know, the disciples, oh, you know, somebody forgot to bring the bread. And now Jesus talks about, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the uh, Herod. And the disciples, he said the word leaven. I think he's mad at us because we forgot bread. We're in big trouble. Um, and that has nothing to do with what Jesus just said. Jesus was actually giving some very wise philosophical, spiritual truth to the disciples. And it was just instructing them with great pearls of wisdom. But the disciples were thinking, oh no, we're in trouble. Jesus is mad at us. It's like, oh no, Peter, you should have brought the bread. I didn't bring the bread. You should have brought the bread. Like they're just missing the whole point. Um, I wonder how many of you, how many of us misunderstand the word of Jesus, the, the Bible. The disciples, when they heard the word leaven, they thought, oh no, we're guilty. Some of you read your Bible that way. You read your Bible and you hear something about sin. And you're like, oh, I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell because I'm a horrible person. Uh, is that what the Bible really does? Are you reading the Bible correctly if you walk away from the Bible fully depressed, bummed out and blue? Is that the fruit of reading the Bible? Well, the Bible says no. The Bible says if you read the Bible, you'll be happy. Psalm 119 has all kinds of promises to the person who takes in the word of God and depression is not one of the results of that. So if you're depressed, if you read the word and come out of it depressed, go back and read it again because you read it wrongly. Just if you know, just know that. Man, I feel condemned. Well, there's no condemnation for those in Christ, so you read it wrong. I kind of feel like we need a hearing aid sometimes as people to hear correctly the word of God because it's not condemning. Now you say, Brett, there's blood and guts. The person who is not in tune with the Lord is gonna read the Bible differently. Like the college professor that says, oh, the Bible's full of ethnic cleansing and blood and guts. And if you take a child out uh, because they're disobedient parents, you're supposed to stone them to death. That's what the Bible says. Well, that's a person who's misunderstanding and misreading the word horrifically. People say that stuff all the time. But if you know the scriptures, all the horrible, brutal stories point to the depravity of humanity. And then it makes us understand the love of Christ. And it makes us know that we're saved by God's grace. We, we realize by the Bible, we're wretched, miserable sinners, but it doesn't leave us there. It points us to the grace of God where we're saved by his grace through faith. If you're reading the Bible and you're blue or bummed or depressed, you're reading it wrongly. And I'm not trying to condemn you for that. I'm just saying, uh, go back and keep reading it until you see that it's actually the word of God that's living and powerful and, and joyful and blessed. Uh, mis misinterpreting scripture can bring real depression and real anxiety. Um, how do you hear the word? When you see the woman who was caught in adultery and, and when Jesus says, go your way and sin no more, how did he say that? Did he say to the woman with disgust, now go your way, stupid woman, and sin no more? Is that what he said? No. 
See, some of you might read it that way. No, he told the woman to go sin no more. No, I believe it was with great compassion because he said, neither do I condemn you. Where's all your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Now go your way. It's almost like he's freeing this woman up to not have to go and do the same sinful stuff that was ruining her life before. It was a, a beautiful invitation to go and, and, and walk with Jesus. Um, we need to hear the word with the right tone. Well, the disciples were freaking out. Jesus, verse 17, when, the, when Jesus knew what the disciples were thinking, uh, he said unto them, why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive ye not yet neither understand? Have you uh, your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not? Having ears hear ye not? And do ye not remember? Remember what? Well, verse 19, when I break the five, uh, five loaves among 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said unto him, 12. And when those uh, seven among the 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? Jesus is saying, you're worried about a little bread. You forgot to bring a loaf of bread. Do you remember the first story when I fed? See, this is where it's proof positive these cardigan-wearing, pipe-puffing professors haven't read the full story. Read the context. Uh, the, the feeding of the 4,000 wasn't Mark getting his numbers wrong. Uh, the feeding of the 4,000 was the second time Jesus said, don't you guys remember the feeding of the 5,000? How many baskets were taken up? 12. Now remember what we just did just 10 minutes ago? How many were? Seven. Don't you understand? We're not worried about our bread. We're not worried about provision. You can trust me on this one, Jesus is saying. Um, you know, uh, the disciples make the mistake you and I make, I think, where we try to hide that we don't have a clue. Have you ever been in a business meeting and they're talking about something intense and you don't understand what they're talking about, but you're not gonna say that. You're just gonna sit there and nod and look intellectual. <laughs> Got it, right on. But really, you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I know some of you guys have done that. I have done that. That's what the disciples are trying to do. Oh, I think he was talking about the bread and I think he were in trouble. And what, what's he talking about? I don't know. What's he talking about? We're in trouble. Jesus said, come on, guys, don't you understand? I can handle the bread thing. I've got this provision thing down. Sometimes, the, once in a while, the disciples do the right thing and they say, Jesus, we don't understand what you were just talking about. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you. Like Jesus is very nice about that. Uh, um, I love what Socrates said. I, I can uh, ascribe to this thing. He says, I am the wisest man alive for I know one thing and that is that I know nothing. <laughs> That's wisdom right there, uh, wisdom. Um, but uh, free advice from old Pastor Brad, if you're marching around like you know everything, chances are you don't. Be careful with that. Um, but back to our, our section here in Mark chapter eight, verse 15 says, um, take heed of, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Let's go back to that just for a second because we didn't really talk about what, what Jesus, the, the, the spiritual truth he was trying to teach the disciples that they'd missed. What is the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, leaven in the Bible is um, a type of sin. It's always sin. Now, be careful. I've heard sermons where they try to turn leaven into the gospel um, and they confuse that with meal. Uh, but that's a whole other thing. Leaven in the Bible is a type of sin, but um, uh, there's specific types of sin that leaven represents too. In Luke chapter 12, verse uh, uh, one, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy at that particular time. So the leaven of hypocrisy, Jesus calls out, but also the leaven of false teaching. That's what Jesus is referring to right here. The Pharisees had false teaching that they were teaching the people. Um, it's articulated, you can jot it down in Galatians 5, verses one through nine, where Jesus said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump when he's talking about the, the Pharisees who were trying to circumcise the Gentiles and all that stuff. Uh, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, and, and, then, and then you say, well, what's the leaven of Herod? Well, that's a little more confusing. There's debate, people debate on what that is. Some people say the leaven of Herod was that the Jews were submitting to the Roman Empire and they were just okay with that. And that was the leaven. I'm not sure I agree with that one. Um, I believe when Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, that's the religious weirdos. Watch out for their leaven, but also watch out for the worldling like Herod and his leaven. Um, and that would be just general, you know, Hellenistic, uh, Roman, even uh, sinful behavior. Uh, watch out for being worldly and godless and pagan. 
like the Romans, like Herod Agrippa. Um, so I believe that's what it is. Um, be careful, make sure and always check the context of stories. That's where the, you know, um, a lot of people go wrong. Um, you know, we gotta stick with good, solid Bible teaching. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I believe there's leaven that has crept into the modern day church where teachings have moved away from the truth of the Bible. You gotta stick with the Bible. You gotta act 17, 11, be as Berean, searching the scriptures to see if these things are true or false. Um, I, I always crack up because once in a while, someone, Brett, I, I'm uh, being a Berean. Uh, I'm, I'm here to correct you. I'm like, okay, fire away. You said chapter 12 when you, I think you meant chapter 10. Oh, brother, come on. That's not being a Berean. That's just being a weirdo. We all make mistakes. I've uh, wrong addresses sometimes. I'm sorry about that. And by the way, any pastor with a pulse makes those same mistakes. I, when, you, when you're being a Berean, what you're looking for is false teaching, where, where we're teaching something that's contrary to what the scriptures teach. And that's kind of a different thing. Um, one of the easiest ways to get off course is when, when ministries, pastors, put a verse up on, those, on the screen, um, but it stands alone. You can convince anybody of anything uh, with that. Um, be careful. And that's one of the reasons we love going through the Bible verse by verse. It's really hard to teach out of context when you're covering the whole scripture and not skipping a verse or a chapter. I'm not boasting about that. I would say that that is a good plan. I, I wish every church would go through the Bible verse by verse because it's a safe, uh, safe thing. I could convince people with scriptures, you know, one of my favorite life verses, uh, Proverbs 30, verse eight, feed me with food convenient for me. <laughs> uh, that's convenient. Uh, Chick-fil-A is biblical. Um, no, that's out of context. If you actually read the verse, it's not talking about that at all. Uh, but you can, make, you can convince people of stuff with just using little sections of scripture. Well, uh, moving along, verse 22, it says, um, and he, Jesus, cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes, he put his, um, put his hands upon him and he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again on his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to, to his house saying, neither go into town or tell anyone in the town. Oh, there's so much about this healing of this blind man. Um, uh, first of all, why did Jesus have to do two attempts at healing him? Was Jesus just a little off his game that day? Of course not. So we, I want to clear that up. I said, well, Jesus tried once and he kind of didn't get it. He was seeing men as trees, so he had to kind of do it again. Um, no, that's not because Jesus was not struggling with power. Uh, can he heal a blind man? C Jesus can speak the sun into existence. Let there be light, Brrr, sun in the universe. So the healing, of, he, didn't, he wasn't struggling with this. So it, it begs the question, why was this guy not healed the first time? And some people would say it's a blind man's fault. He didn't have enough faith. Um, that can be tricky. Um, the Bible does say that Jesus could do no healings in certain towns because of their unbelief. That's kind of interesting. So we do know that there's a certain truth there. There is a false teaching out there. And that is if you have enough faith, God will do anything for you. Uh, he'll heal you every time. There's old churches and ministries. Remember the churches that have the um, school of Hogwarts for Christians and stuff like that? Uh, miracle schools and stuff. They're also the ones that tend to teach uh, you need to be healed every time. And if you're not being healed, if you have cancer and you're not being healed, you don't have enough faith. That's what they try to teach you. And by the way, that's really damaging to people. Um, uh, and by the way, that teaching gets really goofy when the pastor who's preaching that nonsense gets cancer himself and uh, he doesn't have enough faith when he's not healed. Um, that's ridiculous. Paul the apostle had an infirmity of the flesh, prayed three times. The Lord said, stop praying for that, Paul. You're gonna be stuck with that infirmity. I'm not gonna heal you of that you know, until he gets to heaven. Um, Peter and John walked by a guy that was crippled and Jesus walked by him at the gate, beautiful, no doubt, many times before, but never healed the guy. Much, much later, after Jesus died, rose again, ascended in heaven, Peter and J John walked through the gate, beautiful again. They see the crippled guy and they say, he says, alms, you know, to the poor. And, and they say, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Why didn't Jesus heal that guy when they walked through? Timing, 
Lord has a timing, Lord has a plan and a purpose. If you're a Christian and you have a sickness, I believe you'll be healed 100% of the time. The question is when? It might be a miraculous healing right now. And we've seen that here at Athey Creek, healing of, of cancer and, and uh, ailments that you think, wow, even doctors shocked and amazed. We see that. But sometimes we see the Lord progressively, slowly heal someone through time or even medicine and doctors. We're thankful for that. But ultimately, if you're not healed in that way, you will be healed if you're a Christian when you get to heaven. Uh, you'll be given a new body, no more cancer, no more sick, no more sorrow, no more death. Um, so ultimately we all do get healed. The question is more about when. So why would God not heal someone right away? You know, some scholars have suggested the Lord was, Jesus was working greater faith in this man. Maybe he had very tiny smidgen of faith. And when Jesus said, you know, put spit on his eyes um, and he sees men as trees, maybe that was enough to spark, wow, at least I can see men as trees. Maybe that bolstered his faith. Maybe Jesus was building faith within this guy so that the next time around he was healed. Um, you know, Jesus could do no miracle because of their unbelief in Gadara. Remember that? Uh, also in Nazareth, they could, he couldn't do any miracles there because of their unbelief. So some would say this man needed his faith bolstered and that's why Jesus did it progressively. Um, uh, all that to say, God does heal us. Jesus, um, why didn't he build, uh, heal him the first time? He was building faith. Maybe there was one other lesson, a persistence in prayer. Maybe Jesus is teaching you and me as we read this story that there, we need to persist in prayer, not easily give up. If we pray one time for healing, uh, do you know you, you, you can pray again? In fact, Jesus talked in Luke 18 about the unjust judge. Remember the woman who had the, the need and she kept bugging the judge over and over and Jesus said, how much more will the Lord help you more than this unjust judge if you ask you know, with persistence? The prayer of a fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So that is praying with uh, repetition, persevering in prayer. Maybe that's the lesson. But there's a final lesson that I would, I would say before we move on and finish up this chapter. Um, we all love singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. One of the things I've learned in my Christian walk is um, I, I sing that line in Amazing Grace, I was blind, but now I see. Um, I've learned the older I get, I, I thought I saw clearly, but actually I'm not seeing as clearly as I thought I did. Have you ever noticed that? The older you get as a Christian, you kind of sing, I was blind, but now I kind of see, sort of. Um, uh, I'm reminded, you know, um, of, of what Peter warns about in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9. He's got this huge list of things you and I should see evidence in our lives. Check this out. Beside this, Peter says, giving all diligence, add your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, um, it says, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice this, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. We're talking about a Christian here because his sins were purged. But if you don't have virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and love, if you don't have those things, you're still seeing kind of dimly. You're seeing men as trees. If you're lacking these things, you are blind. I'm reminded you know, of, of what um, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as long as I'm known. So I guess there's stages of being blind. There's just totally blind. There's partially blind, seeing through glass darkly. And then there's clarity that's ultimately gonna be seen in heaven. Uh, one more thing I wanna add to this um, about this. Um, notice Jesus, he heals seven blind people. Do you know that in the Bible? But every time he seems to use different methods and means. This time he, used, he spits in the guy's eye. There's another story where he made spit and mud and put it in his eyes. There's another time where he touches the blind man's eyes. There's another time where he simply speaks the word and the person sees. Um, and the reason I point that out is just because it worked once one way doesn't mean that that's what's called for later. This also shows that Jesus cares for each one of these blind people in sort of a custom way. He touches them in a custom way. And the reason I say that is if you're in ministry, don't just you know, have a formula that you'd practice on people um, to make things work. 
Um, be sensitive to how the Lord wants you to minister. Some people need a special touch, a certain kind of touch in ministry. Jesus, of course, is perfectly tuned into that. Well, verse 27, we're almost done. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying unto them, who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and, and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Does this sound familiar? We covered this in Matthew chapter 16. And again, Mark gives us the Reader's Digest version, the little small Cliff's Notes version of that story. There's things, there's things missing, isn't there? If you notice, he's missing, you know, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this by my Father, which is in heaven. Remember when Peter said that? You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Um, Mark says, you're the Christ. And, and Jesus doesn't even commend Peter uh, like, like he does in Matthew. Mark just gives the, the, the short version, you know? And, um, and so because of that, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. This is a great reminder for us of, of who Jesus is. He's the, the Messiah, the son of the living God, the Christos, um, and that's what we get from this. If you wanna deep dive in that whole thing, go back to our teaching in Matthew uh, 16, verses 13 through 28, it's online, it's called, Who Do You Say That I Am? And we spent a whole Sunday talking about that. Uh, but he says, go and don't tell anybody um, uh, and, um, and so, uh, Peter did, by the way, when it says here, there is something that Mark does give us that we don't have in the gospel of Matthew, the one main thing, when it says Peter took him and began to rebuke Jesus, interesting, the word rebuke there is that he was constantly rebuking. Like he over and over saying, no, I'm not gonna let you, no. Remember when, in not so Lord, I will never let them do that to you is what he said in Matthew. But here he's just, rebuking Jesus. You're not gonna die. You're not gonna go to Jerusalem. We're not gonna let the cross happen. And, and finally, Jesus turns and says, uh, I rebuke thee, Satan. Now, question, was Jesus calling Peter Satan? No, um, Peter was saying stuff that was from Satan. Satan didn't want Jesus to go to the cross and defeat sin and death. Um, Satan was putting those words in, in Peter's mouth. And can I just give you a word of caution? Watch out when you walk up to your friend and give them counsel because you think it's right. Um, I can see why Peter would say, Lord, you're not, I, I'm not gonna let you die. Like you can kind of commend Peter for such a nice noble idea, but had Peter been correct about that, we'd all be doomed to hell. So be careful with the words. Nathan the prophet made that mistake. Remember when David said, I'm going to build the temple of God in Jerusalem. And Nathan said, awesome, God bless you. The Lord is with you. Go do the all that's in your heart and amen and amen. And then Nathan goes home. And at night, the Lord says, Nathan, you misspoke. You're supposed to be my prophet speaking my word. And you gave David the wrong word. David cannot build the temple. He's a man of blood, a man of war. And you gotta go tell him. So Nathan, Nathan the prophet had to go eat um, humble pie and say, David, I'm sorry, I told you you could build the temple, but you can't. You got blood on your hands and so you can't do that. And so what did David do? Um, he went around slaughtering people. That's what he was good at. Uh, he went and killed everybody uh, and got ready to, for his son to build the temple. Um, but the point is, I see that in Christian behavior. You know, the, 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 the girl that comes up to her friend who's married and she says, oh, my husband's a jerk. He leaves his socks on the floor and sometimes he doesn't like the food I cook at night and, and I'm really sad. Divorce him, he's a horrible guy. He's abusive because he doesn't like your food and, and, and that you feel for your friend. So you give him that advice. That's advice from the devil. Be careful, just don't just spew what you're on your heart. Remember, your heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Man, we're all into our soul and what we think, I feel my soul, I feel that. What does the Bible say about that? Well, Jesus ends this chapter dealing with that very issue, by the way, in verse 34. It says, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. 
but whosoever shall lose his life <clears throat> for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. <clears throat> and what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus gives us um, this huge word about the soul. Now the Greek word here is psyche. So the world talks about your psychology, your mind, your emotions, a part of you that thinks and feels. And the world claims to be the authority on the human soul. Jesus says, no, I'm the authority on the soul, the psyche. And he says, here's the secret. If you wanna come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Um, what is a man gonna gain uh, if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul? Um, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the idea. Um, we become a culture of people that live for our own psyche. It's all about yourself. Jesus says, deny yourself. The world says, live for yourself. It's all about self. When we look at <clears throat> you know, your social media, we see pictures of yourself. We see magazines out there on the magazine rack, Self Magazine. There's a whole magazine called Self. We defend our self. We do this and that for our self. It's all about the self. Take the selfie. Brett, why are you saying it that way? Because I want you to see how stupid it is. It's really, really stupid that we're so focused on ourselves. Listen, the more you live for yourself, the more you think about yourself, the more miserable you will be, I guarantee you. There's a reason why all these kids that have pictures, 20,000 pictures of themselves posing with duck lips over and over and over again. There's a reason why there's depression and anxiety that comes from that. If you wanna be miserable, focus on yourself. Um, try this, instead of you know, focusing on yourself, try focusing on others. That's what the Bible says. Um, Jesus denied himself when he came and he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. Um, we gotta watch out for this self-centered culture that we've, we, we're driven by self and we've gotta lose that. Um, the world says, build your self-esteem. The Bible says, esteem others better than yourself. That's what the Bible says. Watch out, it's a very worldly thing that's crept into the church. The church has written books. There's all kinds of Christian books about improving yourself and how you're enough, even though you're not. Watch out, it's just a total lie from the pit of hell. Uh, maybe when somebody talks to you, you should say, get thee behind me, Satan. Don't say that to your friend. <clears throat> um, but that would have been good uh, for that. <clears throat> well, last verse, verse 38, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the son of man be ashamed. And when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy, angel, holy angels. Um, be careful, uh, this one, uh, no one should be ashamed of Christ. Once in a while, I get a, a version of this from people. Brett, you don't really lead people to Christ in the correct manner. You have them secretly, you know, accept Christ. Hey, I've had them come forward before too. Um, but is it required for a person to be, go to heaven to walk in front of a multitude of people and come down like Billy Graham style? Do you have to do that to be saved? No, the, the Bible gives us clarity. In fact, this is a very clear verse. One of many, if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If, if it all said, and Billy Graham needs to be saying, come forward, you come, I'll wait. And George Beverly Shea singing just as I am without one plea. And, and you gotta come in front of millions of people. That's a beautiful thing. I'm not knocking that, but that's not required. Many of the conversions you see in the New Testament are private. People just accepting Jesus doing what this verse says. Well, Brett, aren't you supposed to publicly do Well, that comes later. And by the way, declaring and showing that is a work of the flesh. You're not saved by that. It is a result of being saved. Baptism is the best way to declare your faith publicly. It's, it's also obedient. When you get baptized, you're saying in front of people that are there, I believe in Jesus Christ. It's a public declaration of your faith. Um, I believe baptism is a better way even than walking in front of a huge multitude. What's the number one fear of people? getting in front of a big crowd. Why would we put that as a barrier to someone repenting of their sins and accepting Jesus? I'm just saying, we gotta be careful with that one. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't be ashamed of Christ. That's obvious here. But don't misconstrue this verse as meaning you have to come forward. So we end with that. Uh, if you've not been saved, read this verse one more time that's on the wall. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Bible says you'll be saved. I love that. Let's pray. 
And Lord, as we close this service out, we are so thankful for the gospel, the good news. Lord, is there's anyone here who doesn't know you, may they accept you and believe. We give this study now in chapter eight. May it bring good fruit in our lives. I pray that we'd meditate on it and be like the tree firmly planted by the river of water and bring forth good fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.